Aloha, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii, it's time for responsible change. And we have the good fortune of having with us today, Professor Vernelia Randall, Professor Emerita of Dayton University School of Law, and one of the leading experts on race, racism, and the law. Ben Davis, currently professor, probably just finished grading exams for Washington and Lee School of I Law. I wish. <laughs> and Professor Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law. And David Louie, former attorney general for the state of Hawaii and leading civil litigator, mediator, and arbitrator here in Honolulu. Welcome all of you. And as we were getting ready to get started, there were a number of topics out there that were bouncing around and all of them seem to have connections, abortion, gun violence, and other, other topics to a discriminatory impact, both race and class discriminatory impacts. Hey, Professor Randall, hey, what were your thoughts that you were sharing with us as we were getting started? Hey, I think that getting rid of racism should, as, as a matter of law, shouldn't be the goal. It should be getting rid of racial discrimination. And that I think the law is very capable of dealing with racial discrimination. The problem we have is we limit racial discrimination to intentional. And no other area of uh, kind of injury law is that so. So like court law and, and criminal law, you can be responsible if you do something negligently. You can be responsible if you do something recklessly. And you can even have some strict liability where they say, hey, if you do this act, we don't care what your state of mind is. You're responsible just for doing the act. I believe we need to bring uh, discrimination law into the 21st century by making all levels, states of mind actionable, both criminally and um, civilly. And if there are civil liabilities and consequences for negligent discrimination that the employers and institutions might be held responsible for. Dan, David, what do you think about whether that might motivate and generate some behavioral and attitudinal change in those <clears throat> sectors? Well, well, certainly uh, I would agree that uh, putting monetary penalties on behavior uh, will generate um, change. <clears throat> the tort system in America <clears throat> has generated a lot of safety improvements because people, corporations, insurance companies can get held liable <clears throat> for not being safe. And so um, that, that, would, that would certainly you know, uh, make a change, I think. In, it, it could certainly affect behavior. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'd second that, and I, I just want to make sure everyone also understands that what uh, Professor Randall is suggesting is completely consistent with the international standard. Under the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the definition of racial discrimination is both purpose and effect, and so it's a broader vision that's inside than what's inside the United States. And one of the problems with the way it is in the United States is that people will say, well, I didn't intend to do it. So it, I have some kind of innocence, so to speak. And it's not true. I mean, if the effect of what you're doing, whatever, it, or, or what is happening is racial discrimination, then uh, it doesn't matter whether you feel you're innocent or not. It, that There's a racial discrimination, a discriminatory problem. So I, I think it's bringing the United States into the 21st century and also bringing it consistent with international standards on treaties that we have signed, that we are bound by as a state, I think would, would be wonderful. 
But one of the problems with the treaties, and I actually did a lot of work on the International uh, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And Pete, we, the United States has a terrible habit. The habit is whenever it signs a human rights treaty, like the CERD, the elimination of all forms, it puts a, I want to say flyer, but that's not the right word. It puts a limitation saying that no matter what is in this treaty, you American have no more rights than what our constitution gives you. True. true. So it basically true. makes the treat if 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 constitutionally, and this is what's happened. We have constitutionally said that uh, the discrimination is only intentional. The treaty defines it broader, but the United States says no, not for American citizens. Um, and, 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 you, and that's one reason we need an anti-discrimination law for the 21st century because we can't rely on the human rights treaty as a source of rights. Yeah, I, 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 I should be. I, I would just uh, add on that the reason why the United States does that on human rights treaties goes back to basically 1948 and the Genocide Convention, and essentially the hesitation of uh, Southerners uh, to have us ratify that because they were worried that it would affect segregation, right? And uh, there was a whole battle where Eisenhower basically cut a deal, which was like, pass the Genocide Convention, don't pass the Bricker Amendment that would reduce significantly federal government powers. And I promise not to bring any human rights treaties forward. You know, that was the cut. That was the deal. All right. And, you know, so even with that, you go back to the same old stuff of discrimination. You see, it's really deep. and. Uh, I uh, really think that you're onto something, Professor Randall, uh, and also uh, uh, General Louis, uh, because what you're really doing is uh, making a distinction, and I think it's probably the most important distinction I've seen made in this time that we live between living what is truth and living what is lie, okay? And that in the sense, what we have right now is uh, so many different aspects of our society where we're being encouraged to live a lie. You can look at all these, you know, the, 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 the three Republican candidates for uh, the, uh, I guess, for the governorship in uh, Pennsylvania were asked who won the election in 2020. And none of them could say that Joe Biden <laughs> won. And so the Philadelphia Inquirer was unable to make a recommendation as to who to vote for simply because that you know they weren't in touch with reality right you see and it's that kind of lie going in so many different ways this you know the, with the the stop woke act stuff all the lgbtq hassling stuff all that stuff all based on a series of very rich and sophisticated lying it's like sales talk as opposed to the truth the truth of how lgbtq kids are the truth about what is our American history in all its glory. Uh, and even, I would go so far, that the lie is also in the Alito draft that came out. His draft is a complete lie in terms of the amount. And I know it's hard to say this, but I have to, because it, 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 it is such a distorted view of American tradition and history. like. That it, it, it's this truth versus lie battle that I think that is kind of the existential battle in this trying to have a democracy now and try to maintain this democracy. Um, just on the Alito draft, if I could speak to this, one of the things that struck me is that everything that happened before the 19th Amendment in 1920 is irrelevant because women did not have meaningful participation in the democracy whether you go back to Anglo-American history or U.S. history. And I'd even go farther, which is to say that Black women 
didn't have that possibility until the 65 Voting Rights Act, let alone other minorities too. So it's really only anything before 1965 is nonsense in there. Because whoever you wrote, whatever was that distinguished old guy or founder or something like that, they were operating in an environment when women were not having meaningful possibilities to participate. The other thing I'd say is that it mentions nothing about the whole history of forced pregnancies during slavery, where it was basically using Black women to breed so that they could then sell the babies to go down south where it was more profitable in the internal market. There's nothing about forced pregnancy in that history. You know, it's just appalling. So I've been really but happy. Really, in the, I was mentioning that it, it's a lie in another way. The fact in many places in the United States, ab abortion in the late 1800s was not illegal. Thank you. Thank the, you. The, 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 and uh, especially pre-viability. Right. It wasn't even called abortion. There was another name, and I don't remember what it was. And there, uh, the big problem was that not was that there was all of these people doing abortions who were unskilled, and 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 I think doctors wanted to take it over. So I think the push sort of was like, let's move this into a medical arena. Which, was, which wasn't unrealistic, but what was unrealistic was the idea that uh, uh, Alito's draft makes it seem like that the value of American society has always been anti-abortion until 50 years ago. And, and in fact, in the late 1800s, it, 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 uh, in many right. places, it was, it was uh, legal. Uh, especially pre-viability. Uh, slightly larger context to this, uh, Professor Randall. The, the thing that I disagree with uh, in, in Justice Alito's draft opinion is the idea of the textualists of, of Justice Thomas, of, of Justice Scalia, that, that um, we have to go to the text of the Constitution. We're not going to consider it as a living document. We're not going to consider it in the context of modern society and modern culture and modern sensibilities and modern, uh, the, you know, the way people think, we are going to go back to define it as it was defined in 1896 or, or 1796, uh, along with some amendments. And the idea that, that you can uh, uh, rule a country, run a country, have a society based upon documents from 200 years ago, unchangeable, okay? Unchangeable, that's that's ridiculous to me. Yeah, and yeah. The idea- Oh, that, I agree 100% uh, with you. That, that, uh, uh, um, um, modern society is, I think, one of the fallacies that unfortunately has received a lot of attention from the Republican uh, side and the conservative justices. And the reason they do this to me is because what they are trying to say is, you know what? We don't like modern society. We don't like the rise of black people. We don't like the rise of people of color. We don't like the rise of LGBTQ people or women. We wanna go back to the good old days. That's what MAGA was all about. The good old days when yes. rights were supreme and nobody else had anything. And so right. it's all part of this looking backwards to some idealized uh, uh, you know, society that never existed, but it's out of step in my view, with how you run a society, how you have people live together in harmony, uh, uh, taking into account all of their, their feelings, uh, their concerns, and, and how society acts. And so I think it's just a it's indicative of a larger problem uh, that we have at the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and, I think that's, go ahead, Ben. I was just gonna say the, uh... You know, the, the whole notion of agency, if I hear autonomy of people today to be able to decide how they're going to live their life, you know, uh, and trying to put us back into an eight, 18th century frame, you know, it reminds me of this, actually, this was Alito 
commenting to Scalia in one of the oral arguments in one case along the way, where Alito said, well, you know, Justice Scalia is trying to figure out what the founders thought about the internet. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, come on, you know the game doesn't work. You know what I mean? You know the game doesn't work. And, and uh, the, the other thing is that um, I have noticed that uh, when people speak of agency of people, for example, in Michigan, there was a uh, referendum to get rid of affirmative action, and that was fought in the Supreme Court. And in the oral argument there, um, the comment was made by one of the advocates to uh, overturn the referendum that, that you know, the, like 90% of the Michiganders who were Black voted against the referendum. I mean, to me, that's a sense of agency of you can understand what's going on and you don't buy it, okay? You don't buy it. And so you go against it. But, you know, I think it was Alito, it was kind of a cavalier or it was uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts is kind of saying something like, well, maybe they don't know what's good for them. I mean, there's this mismatch theory, right? You know, which is, I've dealt with the guy who wrote the mismatch theory stuff, you know, and, and basically said to him, has anybody who's ever gotten one of those nice degrees from one of those nice schools said, oh, heck, I'm so sorry I got that degree and I'm going to go back. Uh, I wish I had gone to a, a, a school that's lower in the hierarchy, you know? I mean, I think that that 18 year old who can look at the top options and their family and decide this is what I want to do, that's agency, you know? I mean, I went to Harvard in my first, in my freshman class was Yo Yo Ma, okay? I mean, me to Yo Yo Ma is like miles, right? In terms of any competence at anything, right? But does that mean that I didn't enjoy the time I was at Yo Yo, uh, I was at Harvard? No, it's absurd. And I just, I find it unfortunate that uh, they don't get the agency of people who are other than basically white male. That they will listen to, but the agency- but, Well, of, only a certain class of white males and yes, they oh, are- Yes, certain class and, of rich white males. And, yeah. and, and what's they, the problem is, and this is the class problem, is being fooled that, you know, it's kind of like, all of these things, how I mean, there's so many things that's going on that is not in the interest of the majority of Americans. And yet uh, the, our leadership keeps doing things that, you know, are counter to their interests and they get voted back in by a large percentage of them. I, uh, uh, I, I wanna talk about uh, Buffalo. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, another mass murder, another racial mass murder. I mean, uh, with guns, but we've had racial mass murders before, both with guns and with uh, um, uh, a bomb. I don't want to min. Uh, we. It's a lot to take in. But I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the singular violence that their uh, uh, Black and Brown and Native and Asian people are being killed singularly. And the cumulative numbers are significant and it's racial violence. And, we seem to only pay attention, good attention, for whatever it's worth, is when they're killed in groups, but not when you know they're being uh, stalked and assaulted and harassed and and killed singularly uh, by all kinds of people. Uh, yeah, I just, and, and people aren't even wearing hoods. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> you know, they're 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 putting it up on Twitter or where Twitch or whatever. They're you know they're he live streaming. 30, 30, he posted his manifesto thirty minutes before he was going to do it with a chip, grab a chip, and no one, as far as I understand, t contacted the police. But so, and I think he he cased the place before. And the, the, and the guard who shot him 
had been watching him, you know, when, when he cased the place before. So he, you know, he was known as, as, as a potential person to do that. But again, he's living a lie. Okay, I'm going to say it like that. He had a whole lie in his head about, you know, this replacement theory stuff and all that. And it's like, you got truth and you got a lie, you know, and that, that until, until, you know, we're basically going to fight for the truth, if I could say it like that. And to, I mean, this guy's 18. I mean, you could say, well, you know, maybe back in the old days, he was one of those old racist guys from back in the, this guy who's been regenerating this kind of stuff in the particular but, space. And it, but it's the just, thing is, is yeah, I, I sort of think, because I look, I'm the age of his grandparents. I, I would be his grandparent, maybe even his great grandparent. Uh, and I think, you know what, this is, I, I think I, this is surprising because all the people my age were pissed off back then. Yeah. About yeah. the Civil Rights Act. Yep. About, and they've been pissed off for the last 50, 60 years. And yep. they've been raising their children with that hate. And their children have been raising their children with that hate. And so it, it's not surprising at all, you know, that, yeah. that he would have but, that level of hate. And then the internet, you know, my son, my oldest son says the thing about the internet is is that uh, it used to be uh, every community had five crazy people, and everybody would say those are the five crazy people. Right. But every and everybody recognized them as that. But now those five crazy people get online, and now there's a thousand of them believing the same thing. Uh, and one more thing I want to say. The replacement theory is so old in the United States. It is, it, they may not have called it the replacement theory, but ev it, this is what drove the 1790 law saying only white people could immigrate. This is what drove the 1880 uh, Chinese exclusion law. This is what drove the 1920 country allocations that didn't allocate to Asian and African country. This is what drove Anglo-Saxons being mad about Germans. And they actually used the term replacement back in the 1800s. These Germans are coming here and they're disrupting our culture and they're gonna make, they're replacing us. It's been, we don't talk about that when we talk about we're a nation of immigrants. Some immigrants. Some slaves but but some the replacement slaves. theory is really just a discredited, crazy uh, reason that that is used to justify violence and used to justify hate. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's, it's the same theory about how the Jews were going to take over the world, how the Chinese were going were gonna to come in and, and take over the, uh, the world and, and uh, you know, kill everybody, rape the women. And, and do all kinds of bad things. And, and there's just these crazy theories out there that people buy into and they believe uh, because they, they're in their little bubble and, and their friends believe this and they, and they talk about it. But, but it, it's unfortunate. Uh, the, I, I don't know how to stop that kind of craziness, okay? Um, people are dumb sometimes. I mean, I think by and large people are smart and, and get it, but you know, if you're in your little bubble and you're listening to Tucker Carlson, boy, you can get misled pretty darn easily. Okay, yep. and you, can, you can ignore facts and reality. Yeah, they are. No, slick. I think that's right. I think that, and I, I think want, that. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just, want, I just want to add one thing that I think is really interesting right now. So I just want to throw this out: is that uh, you know, um, there's a North. Carolina Women's Health Organization filed a uh, amicus request to leave to do an amicus in the Dobbs case on Monday because they part of the argument is that they said that the Equal Rights Amendment came into effect on January 27, 2022. And huh? they and yes, that's right, because it was two years after 38 uh, states had signed it. And there's a whole issue about states rescinding and all that. I understand all that stuff. 
Okay. But that that was filed on, with a request for a leave to make a brief on Monday of this week. And uh, I think that that is a really interesting thing because of two things. One is apparently the issue on the ERA is subjudiciary somewhere in like the DC circuit or something. So it's not, you know, there's like a mess sort of if the Supreme Court does something while that's coming up. The other thing is that the old case where uh, Scalia talked about, well, they're pregnant men, sorry, the women and unpregnant men, sorry, unpregnant women and men as one group, and then pregnant women, uh, so, the, the, so it wasn't a sex-based equal protection argument that could be made. <laughs> but now the thing is, is that if this ERA is in, it's a substantive standard for women. And in the language speaks to women. In, in the and and that I think is a big interesting development for anything they're going to do with regard to abortion or anything else. If that ERA argument succeeds on the idea that as of the twenty seventh of January, so you know I I see people who are like skeptical about it. I understand that. What I love is that the lawyer who wrote this put it in on Monday, after and saying that you know they had consent. Because it, the, the consent from both sides said at any stage of the proceeding, and and the what prompted them was the Alito draft leak too, you know. So it's just that that just watch that space to see what the Supreme Court's doing with that. As far as I see, they have not they haven't gotten rid of it yet. Yeah. Okay. In in our last minute, last thoughts, Professor Randall. Uh, I I want to go back to people really thinking about uh, uh, making racial discrimination, getting a 21st century racial discrimination law uh, that is really good. And uh, because what we have now is inadequate for 21st century discrimination. David, your thoughts? You know, I, I, I just think uh, we have so much division, so much polarity, so much, so much uh, non-listening to people. Uh, we do need to uh, foster and come together as a civil society uh, to address these things and, and uh, have a little more tolerance uh, for, for people, except for the crazies, I, I think. I, I don't want to tolerate them. But, but uh, we, we really need to, to address these problems, uh, women's rights, abortion, racial discrimination, all of those things, they're going to they're gonna make it tough for us. But I have hope. I, I certainly have hope, and I think we can do it. Okay, and some of those crazies that we might not be looking to tolerate might include elected officials in some <laughs> cases. <laughs> Thank Hopefully. you all. Great thoughts, great insights, another lively, candid session covered a lot of ground. Thanks all of you for viewing and joining us and those who view it later. Come back and see us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.